I stopped using real amps 12 years ago and I never looked back. It works really well and I am far from the only jazz guitarist to do so. For me, actually the biggest advantage to not using an amp is really not what I expected, but it turned out to make a huge difference and solve a problem that I've been trying to fix for years. Well, the first thing I think people are gonna notice when they watch you play tonight is there's no guitar amplifier up there. Yeah, I'm using a direct box and I have been for the DI box for the last couple of years and I just go through the house system, mm -hmm. whatever the house is. Joe got tired of bringing an amp and then decided to just use a DI. And I think you can sort of tell from his sound here, but he does sound really good in concert. For me, it was not about carrying the amp. This was in 1994, and to be honest, I wasn't that surprised that Joe didn't always use an amp. And his very clean tone is also easier to get without a guitar amp, in my experience. I was a bit more surprised that John McLaughlin didn't use amps either. You know, it's more of a convenient thing, but I stopped using amps years ago. I mean, like really, 20 years ago. The louder the volume is on stage, the harder job it is for the engineer out front to get a good sound out front. At the end of my study at the conservatory, I was getting started playing gigs, both concerts and cafe gigs. Most jazz club gigs and cafe gigs are played with the backline of the band. So we just bring our amps and there is no PA needed since the place is not that big and the people are not that loud. The advantage to this is that you get fairly good at dialing in your amp so that it A works in the band and B sounds good in the room and it does make you a bit flexible and used to react to the acoustics of the room. The thing to remember is that you dial in a tone with your ears, not with your eyes. At the time I was playing my ES-175 through either my Fender Twin Amp or my Polytone, sometimes adding an LXP-1 Lexicon Reverb that I'd bought used on eBay. I was actually pretty happy with how this sounded. The situation where this fell apart was when someone had to get my sound into a PA, usually festivals and sometimes bigger jazz clubs. The problem is that I would have one sound coming out of my amp, which was a lot of mids and a lot of treble, but between my rig and the PA, there was a microphone, usually a Shure SM57, and a sound engineer that probably loved Toto or something else from the 80s, where the guitar sounds like the tone RJ is nailing here. And that's of course pretty far from how you want your ES-175 to sound and also not what you expect when what is coming out of your amp is this type of sound. Now this was getting increasingly frustrating but most of the time we just played through our own backline where it didn't really matter. And while I was playing gigs I was also developing my sound and my taste which led to looking for another guitar and my first encounter with a modeler which didn't really work out. While I was trying to figure out how I wanted to sound and how to get that sound, I realized that I wanted to try a semi-hollow guitar with humbuckers instead of the ES-175. The idea was to have a more mid-focused tone and the lack of sustain with the 175 felt very limiting sometimes for some of the things that I wanted to play. I also realized from listening to Kurt Rosenwinkel, Ben Monder and Pat Metheny that I wanted to explore using both delay and reverb together. two effects that I actually still consider a very important part of my sound. The delay pedal that I've seen many people use was the Line 6 DL4, this green box, and I already had the secondhand Lexicon reverb. It was, however, sometimes an issue that the reverb was not that practical, and it felt like it could easily get damaged being a rack unit. I was right out of school, so I didn't have a lot of money, and when I noticed that I might be able to get a multi-effect like the Line 6 Pod XT for only 150 euro more than the delay, and the Pod XT had the Line 6 delay built into it, then that was certainly worth exploring. Essentially, I only needed to check if the reverb was okay. In general, the effects in the Pod XT were surprisingly good, and especially the reverb and the delay. Since it was also modular, then I did experiment a little bit with using the amp simulation in there, but when I used that live, it felt compressed, and it didn't sound and feel anywhere nearly as good as my real amps, so that was quickly turned off. In the meantime, I'd also bought a second-hand Epiphone Sheraton, so this guitar, and my rig at that point was the guitar into the pot 
into either the twin or the polytone and mostly the polytone because it was not as heavy or big as the twin. But of course with this setup I was still having the problem of a random sound guy putting random mics in front of the amp and doing strange things with the EQ. And this was especially at the smaller jazz festivals which I played really a lot of. Before I throw all sound engineers under the bus then let me just say that of course there are great guys out there and I've worked with quite a few of them that are great both for live sound and recording albums. But this was just very often an issue and I really wanted to get rid of it. And surprisingly, going to a better modeler setup did exactly that 90% of the time, just not in the way that you would expect. After using the Pod XT together with the amps for some time, then I was looking for a way to update the rig. The twin sounded great, but only if I could play loud. And it was 43 kilos, which is... 95 pounds. I was considering getting two smaller tube amps and try to build a pedal board, but I was again confronted with how expensive that would be. And then I had a few experiences with recording albums with the twin that really changed things. When you're recording jazz music, it is essentially a live recording and always a bit nerve wracking. I always found it stressful, but also very exciting. And when I showed up to the recording sessions, I often ended up working with recording engineers who wanted to decide how I set up my amp and also put a mic in front of my guitar and telling me to, under no circumstances, use any kind of effects. Now, this of course resulted in me having to play on the recordings with a tone that I didn't like and that was completely different from how I sounded live, which felt very strange, not only for me, but also for the rest of the band. Now, I might want something to sound close to something like this. Or this. But when I listened to the recording, I always felt it sounded like this. Of course, a huge part of the problem was communication and that I didn't know anything about EQing and compression. So I couldn't really explain what it was that I wanted. But I did take part in some mixing sessions where I spent a long time getting rid of the acoustic mic in front of my guitar and trying to get a better EQ and a type of compression that did not make my pick attack a lot louder. Something that I just always really hated. After this series of recordings in 2010, it was clear to me that I needed to find a way to get more control of how I sounded on albums as well. And it felt like it would be nice to have a different process. Until then, I was just showing up and got a Shure SM57 placed in front of the amp. That was set up in a way I didn't like, usually also with that mic in front of my guitar, and that just didn't work. At the time, I had a student who had told me how he found the Pod XT horrible and disliked everything digital, except for maybe one thing, the Fractal Audio Axe FX. I'd never heard about Fractal Audio, so I started checking online what I could find, and there were quite a few YouTube videos on the Axe FX. Hello, my name is Peter Ouchbach. Most of them on how to get a metal tone with a rectifier and a tube screen, or how to sound like Pink Floyd. But I also came across the forum and decided to go to an XFX meeting here in the Netherlands. The XFX was only available if you ordered it from Germany, so you couldn't go to a store to try one, and I also didn't know anybody who had one. The meeting was sort of an odd experience walking around among a lot of people who already had an XFX, but I did get to try one out and dial in a twin tone quickly with the help of one of the guys there that knew what he was doing, because I didn't. And I actually really liked the result. Even though an XFX was pretty expensive, I decided that this was definitely worth trying, and the investment was anyway cheaper than getting tube amps and good effect pedals. Now, needless to say, I really like the XFX, which is also why I'm now on the third generation of Fractal Audio products. Both the effects and the amps in there sound really great, and it does everything that I needed to do, plus that I actually prefer the control of the sound and the volume when I play live. Now, I'm not going to get into how I set it up in this video, but maybe that's something for another video. I've already talked about how the problem with my setup with the amp was not the gear. It was what happened afterwards. And in a way, it shouldn't really change when I went to the fractal stuff. But what I found when playing live in pretty much all situations is that if you give a sound engineer XLR cables, instead of having them set up a mic in front of an amp like they usually do, then that is enough of a pattern interrupt so that they don't just do whatever they usually do and instead listen to what is there and think about how it sounds. To be honest, I did not expect it to solve the problem, but it really did and doing recordings were similar, though there sometimes I'm still 
getting these questions and get asked to recall through whatever amp they have in the studio. For me, the biggest difference when I'm recording is that I can record with a sound that feels like my sound and not an electrified dry recording of a banjo. If you're familiar with my guitar sound, then you probably know it from YouTube. And I'd already stopped using amps when I started making YouTube Hi videos. Guys. Today I wanted to make a lesson about... But for this, the fractal was absolutely perfect. It's incredibly easy to record at home, and I even did the first few years without having an audio interface, just using the line in on my PC. Lately, I've had fun messing around with delay and reverb plugins, trying to learn some tricks from Warren Hewitt over at Produce Like a Pro, and that has meant that I'm often now recording some of the solo guitar things that I post without any reverb and delay, because I like to have the freedom to mess around later, which is of course also why I was told to turn off effects in the studio. But that has now become sort of a sonic playground for me, messing around with a few of my favorite delay and reverb plugins, and just something I have fun doing. For me, it's pretty clear that I can get the sound that I want using a modeler. I doubt if it's really about the brand of that modeler. And it's also easy to see that there are far more advantages than disadvantages to using one. But that doesn't mean that I don't like amps. You need to find the solution that works for you. And I still have my twin and my polytone, even if I don't use them very often. It's also about finding things that inspire you and that are fun to mess around with. Let me know what you think and what you use in the comments. What tone you like and what you need from an amp or an instrument changes over time. And it's good to also enjoy that journey and hopefully not waste too much money along the way. With guitars, you can approach this in sort of a stepwise manner without immediately getting a very expensive instrument, but still end up with a very solid guitar. If you wanna hear about how I replaced my vintage ES-175 with a $400 semi-hollow, then check out this video.